Okay, I think the cat has finished doing his little jig. So um, that's my cue to get started and say hi. I see you're ruining chat already. Hi, welcome, thanks for coming. Um, I am going to try to keep an eye on the chat while I am speaking. I'm not sure if I can read and talk at the same time, but please feel free to type in the chat and ask your questions as we go. Um, you are very welcome to do that. I see a few more people drifting in, but I'm going to get started anyway. Um, cool. So, hi, my name's Lorna. I'm a developer advocate at a company called Ivan. We do open source data things in the cloud. So, I mean, I've got Apache Kafka in the title. We also have Postgres, MySQL, Redis, Cassandra, Influx, M3DB. You get the idea. Open source and data database and Kafka in the cloud. That's what we do. So I am super excited to be here at ApacheCon. Um, I would absolutely never admit in public to having a favorite Apache project because there are so many and I love them all. Um, but I do work a lot with Apache Kafka and I am super excited to be speaking about it today. So um, I'm going to do an intro to Kafka in case anyone isn't familiar with it. Um, Apache Kafka, straight from the website, is an open source distributed event streaming platform. Uh, it, so it's designed for data streaming. It's designed for those uh, modern event driven systems, applications that react to one another, either external applications or uh, different components within your application. Uh, it's very it's uh, it's ideal for real time data. We see it used a lot in the finance sector and in other kind of industrial applications. Um, I see a bunch of like energy applications. My contrived example today, which I hope you will enjoy, is um, like sensors in a factory. We're just going to look at one set of sensors, but in my example that I'll give you the link to, there's a bunch more. Kafka is super scalable, right? It's massively scalable pub sub type setup. Um, it's intended to handle large data sets. It's intended, intended to run as in clusters at scale um, in, a, in a safe and performant way. And uh, in comparison to some of the more traditional, either queue-based or table-based data stores, then um, you can think of Apache Kafka as a distributed log. So you're appending data to the end of the log all the time. And m one or more or lots of applications might come and read that data, but it stays there. It's not done like uh, job queue is. We have different channels. Those are topics, so we have ways, um, you know, we can keep different streams of data separate. And within the topics, we have partitions. These are kind of the unit of sharding, but also mean that you can keep things together um, and in order if you need to. So that's kind of the very high level overview of Kafka if you haven't worked with it before. Um, it is absolutely awesome. That is why you keep on hearing about it. Um, a very simplified diagram of what's going on with Kafka. <laughs> We've got some producers on the left. These are the things that are producing data and writing to Kafka. So they're sending streams of data, maybe in batches, um, straight into Kafka topics. And that might be sensor readings. Um, it might be like streaming real-time data. It could be an application emitting events, what's happening. Um, it could be, yeah, logging, logging events or emitting metrics or we see all sorts. The thing that Kafka is not is it is not transporting large quantities of data, right? You're not sending huge payloads or like whole files or anything over this connection. By default and also by recommendation, if that's a, a technical term, Kafka handles... Uh, Kafka message sizes are typically capped at one meg. So that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, in text, actually, you can send quite a lot, but it's not for sending um, 
any other kind of formats of data or anything like that. On the other side, on the right-hand side of the diagram, I've got some consumers, the things that read a bunch of data off Kafka, kind of work their way through the log, either as records happen, or you can then add something later to process it as well. And that's useful for getting data from one place to another, either for your reporting data warehouses often ingest from anywhere through a Kafka connector um, into wherever you do your reporting. It might be another application. Um, it might be a microservice is one place where we see data like event bus sort of patterns using Kafka really often. Each individual item on your imaginary architecture diagram has probably um, might be doing more than one of these things. They might consume more than one data stream or they might produce one thing and then consume something else or the other way around, consume some data and then produce something new. But when I talk about async API, we're going to have one async API description per imaginary thing on the architecture diagram. And I think that's quite an important concept um, to kind of grok while we're looking at this, uh, looking at this diagram. <sighs> Let's talk about async API. <laughs> and it's something that I am, particularly because I hang out in the Kafka space, I'm seeing uh, more and more often. So async API. It's an open standard. Uh, so it's very much, it feels like right on brand, something that maybe the ApacheCon audience might appreciate. And it's for describing these event-driven and data streaming systems. So it's, you can find out more about it at asyncapi.com. <laughs> it's a YAML or JSON format description. So it's a very machine, readable machine intended format of describing things. Uh, it's almost a language in itself. If you've worked with open API or any of the other really like YAML heavy um, formats, this will seem pretty familiar to you. And async API is definitely, I would call it a sister standard to open API. You know, they, they cover quite different ground, but uh, open API, which is a bit more mature maybe, and in my opinion, covers a smaller problem space because it's synchronous request response mostly, um, then async API is here to cover all of your streaming event-driven systems. So um, as well as the Apache Kafka support that I'm demoing you today, I've also used it for MQTT. It supports MQP, so RabbitMQ. Um, the, if you're using WebSockets, this is quite a good way to describe that communication as well. And in addition to being a standard, the same project um, creates the tools. And I quite like this because while I want lots of competing tools, right? Because that's how open source works, how healthy ecosystems work. Actually knowing that the people who are developing the standard are also building a reference implementation I just, I think it brings something to it, like that when the tools builders are that close to the standard, I think it's super healthy. So <clears throat> tools, uh, they're gonna generate documentation, they're gonna generate code. I'm gonna show you a couple of these tools. I'm gonna show you some um, non-async API project tooling as well that's starting to spring up. Uh, and I'm definitely seeing more and more platforms supporting this and having a bunch more integrations. Uh, why would you use async API? I'm going to show you the how, but it's pointless for you to learn a new trick and not understand why it's useful. And I think that ability to bring the design first concepts from the API space into the event driven space is absolutely crucial. Um, we, we don't like publish APIs and then assume that users will just jump in and use them. They'll be great anymore. You know, we're, we're, Taking that quite seriously, we're we're designing things up front, we're getting early feedback, we're generating documentation and lots of other artifacts from that single specification or description. So to be able to do that for these systems as well, I think is amazing. And there's a lot of crossover there in, de in design first. Async API describes the boundary between the systems. Now, one of the reasons we've always done this in HTTP APIs is because we often offer APIs to third parties. But um, 
it's less common to offer external access to your event streaming platforms, whatever your event streaming platforms are. If you work in a large enough organization, <laughs> um, those other teams genuinely are third parties. Like That's the level at which you need to make sure you've got that contract boundary specified. So I think it's very useful and it's machine readable. So we've got better integrations as well. It's a text based format. So you are going to put it under source control and be able to tell like we last updated our integration on this tag or this commit. Um, this is the most recent thing that changed. I'd like to preview a change. Let's have a look at the pull request. Maybe I'll generate some documentation. I'll just check out the diff and see what's going on. Amazing, amazing, amazing way to collaborate on changes of really complex systems. We use it for source code, but to be able to do it for other things as well, I think is nice. Um, one more thing I love about async API, it plays nicely with other open standards. Like it's intended to play well with what you already have in your setup. So lots of Kafka, um shops use for example avro with a schema registry like you will have a way of describing your payloads so you don't need to repeat that for async api you can just reuse that avro schema inside your async api i don't have the example in this spec but there is an example in the repo that i'm going to link to you so i love that and i think that attitude kind of runs through the, pro the project it's quite a lively and open community and they just want to be part of what's out there rather than replacing what we problems that are already solved. Here's an example of generated docs. And I hope that you today do really enjoy my rather silly example. Um, <laughs> it's all about a factory. So it's this amazing industry. It's called Thingum Industries. They make Thingum Majigs and Thingum Bobs. Um, and it's like an imaginary factory looking at the door sensors. Are the doors open or closed? Which door was that that was opened or closed? Um, this is the docs that I generated from the um, example spec. And you can see there's quite serious field names and whatever in the left hand pane. But in the right hand pane, we've got examples. There's, I mean, there's a whole separate talk about the examples. But um, straight away from reading these examples, you could integrate with this system. I know it's a trivial payload, but um, I still think it's pretty cool. Let's talk about how this works. Now, <clears throat> in my experience, people are typically in one of two camps. Um, they need to know how the car works before they drive it. This section is for you. Um, they would rather not spend their time looking at four slides of YAML. Um, that is fine. Just uh, take a deep breath, um, tweet about what a great time you're having. And next time you see a slide this color, come back to me. OK, <laughs> the async API documents are structured in the same way every time. Um, and if you're watching this recording far in the future, this talk is about async API version 2.0, which is the current version of async API. That's a hint that I expect this to change in future versions. The top level elements, uh, async API is the version of async API that we are following, i.e. 2.0, and an ID. Remember that I said every component in your architecture diagram has its own async API description file. Right, so you've got to be able to tell all those files apart. That's what the ID field is for. And I'm also seeing some like hub event gateway, event hub type products that bring them all together and let you understand the relationships between them. We have an info section for metadata, a servers section describing like where the endpoints are for Kafka, that's the brokers, um, how to connect them, any security requirements. The channels are where we can publish to or subscribe to um, and what goes there. So it's like the real like details of what's available. Um, the web equivalent, I guess, is the endpoints. We've got tagging in from OpenAPI, which is brilliant. It lets you group things together. So if you have a bunch of, you're subscribed to a bunch of different types of events and you want to group the billing events separate from the stock level events, separate from the customer events, I don't know, I'm improvising, then you can tag those to make things easier to find. That's more useful if you have a single API description that covers a lot of different um, operations. 
We have the component section. I lovingly refer to this as the kitchen sink. This is where we keep the reusable items. So let's look at some examples. Here's the info section. This is the metadata. It's not very sexy, but I implore you not to skimp on this section. Please don't take shortcuts here. Um, we have one async API description per thing in the architecture diagram. You got a lot of async API description files. And when you start making services available to other teams or to third parties, the metadata is how people are going to discover your service and understand if it meets their needs. So please, 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 great meaningful titles, great meaningful descriptions, detailed contact information, and a license. The channels are the main thing. So in my example, with the topic in Kafka, is called door sensor. And you can subscribe to it to receive payloads about doors being either open or closed. Um, I've got it's I've got a tag on it, so all the sensor operations are together. It's Kafka binding. Um, and then notice with the message, there's actually no details there. There's just that dollar ref. That's a way of referring to something that is defined somewhere else. In fact, it's defined in the components section. Dollar ref is incredible. It's one of the best things about async API. So it's compiler assisted copy paste, right? It's because you probably write delightful and consistent experiences with the same message structures used in lots of places, the same fields, the same payloads, right? You probably reuse those things. So you can define them once in the components section. Just refer to them when you need them. If for any reason we go ahead and add an extra state to the door other than open and closed, I can't think of why we would do that, but imagine a better example. I don't want to replace that in 37 different places across 15 async API description files. Genuinely, I just want to fix it once. And that's what that gives me. So it's about not just publishing something in the first place, but also about um, maintaining it and keeping it healthy and keeping it tidy and keeping it consistent. The second code example here shows you how you can refer to other files, the component sections in other files. And you'll often see a pattern where all the things that get reused in lots of places are in like a common library description file and all the others then refer into that central file. System works pretty well, in my opinion. Here is that component section, and there you can see the door data message described. It's got a name, it's got a description. We have a payload, it's an object with a couple of different fields, a location, and a state. It can't be more complex than that because it wouldn't fit on the slide. Let's see if I've forgotten to tell you anything important. No, I don't think so, which is cool because I want to show you now some async API tools. I'm going to give you a quick whistle stop tour, but then I'm going to show you some of them in action. Um, the place to start is the async API playground. This is a great place to go and get your feet wet, <laughs> uh, or rather to try something out for the first time. It's um, a place where you can just try some changes to an async API. It's a really nice editor um, for very small things or when you're totally new to it. It's got some validation and some syntax checking when you edit in the left-hand pane. And then you'll see your changes rendered in the right-hand side. So you can just go ahead and kind of work on that, see how it's going to look, check that things look as they should in those two things side by side. Recommended as a brilliant place to start. Um, once it gets bigger than that, you're going to want to use a real um, a real editor. And if you are a person that uses um, a programmer's editor or an IDE, I am guessing most of you are, then um, your own editor is it's your happy place. You're already a, a super user. And I tend to prefer it um, for coders or people who work with other markup, YAML. Um, I think I'm a YAML developer these days. Um, then these are the right tools. I actually am not using the um, async API VS Code extension in this screenshot. I've got some YAML um, plugins. It gives me the syntax highlighting. And I also have that visual tabs thing. 
so I can see how indented I am and it helps to see if I've aligned things up. It's not too bad in this file, which I think is only, I don't know, 50 lines in total. But in real life, they get much bigger than that. The hardest thing is working with a file that size. I've also got the outline in the left-hand pane, which is pretty nice. You can generate documentation. <clears throat> You've seen this already, and it came from one of the async API tools, the generators. This can actually generate more than just documentation. So it can also generate code to immediately read that description and know how it should interact with your system and how it should understand your payload. You can generate code in Java, in Python, um, or in Node.js. And I think the most exciting thing I can do at this point is try to show it to you actually live. So let's see if we can get this working. I'm using uh, a Kafka service, uh, Kafka as a service from um, Ivan because I work there and they pay my hosting bills. Um, it's very easy and quick to cr create, but the cluster takes about three minutes to come up. And I didn't want to try and make small talk with you for three minutes. So I started this a little while ago. The things that you should know about this is that I have enabled the uh, Carapace REST API integration. And that is going to let me use a little web interface to work with the topics later. If I copy the broker details here, then I'm going to put those into the API descriptions. <clears throat> I've got both um, a, a description for publish and a description for subscribe because the docs and the code generate from different perspectives. This is not a thing we are going to fix today. So <laughs> you'll just have to believe me on that. So here I'm going to put, in fact, I think that is the right creds we just put in there. Yeah. And so that's in one spec. Here's the other spec. Please let me know if any of this makes no sense at all. Yeah, perfect. OK. So we've updated our descriptions to give the details of where the server, Kafka server, Kafka broker is. And now we're going to generate some documentation. Um, this is, here are some commands that I made earlier. <laughs> this is because I think it's nicer than watching me type. So this top one is making use of the um, async API generator. It's a global command that you install with NPM. So it's Node.js based. It's AG is the name of the command. So AG, the uh, async API specification followed by the template that you want to use. And I'm also using dash O for the um, output folder, which is going to be the docs folder, and dash dash force write, because I'm pretty sure I've probably written there already. <laughs> so whatever's there, we'll just overwrite it <clears throat> when we do this. So I'm going to run that command here. And it reads the YAML, messes about, I mean, performs great magic and templates messes about. Come on, Lorna. Um, it's quite late where I am. <laughs> uh, I'm getting giddy. And then you get sparkle emoji when it's finished, which I think is charming. And then we can have a look at what was generated. So I'm just going to open that with my browser in the output folder. It's going to be index.html. So here is the Thingam Industries. This is from just... The only input is the YAML file that you just saw. And then the tool made this. And if we scroll down a bit, you can see we've got the servers. Those are the details that I just added. It's also set up to connect on localhost if we want to. And we would create, uh, we would use the uh, platform that we want to use when we generate the code for that. You'll see this in a moment. The left hand navigation is super low contrast. But believe me, there's an operation called door sensor that we can subscribe to. And if I expand this payload stuff over here, you can immediately see the examples. So we're generating that from the async API, which is lovely. And documentation is important. And it also shows you why we should have tech writers or UX experts or whatever also working on these specifications so that we get meaningful output when we do these things. However, I'm making assumptions about an Apache Con audience. I'm guessing you might quite like to see some code. So I'm going to give that a shot as well. My Kafka is up and running already on Ivan. 
Um, if you were watching really closely when I checked out my list of commands, you already spotted this. So I'm going to use the publish the publish description this time. Um, and that's because the code is intended to interact with the thing that's described. So it means that it this specification will generate code that subscribes to some published data. I'm using the Node.js template this time. The output is in the directory generated Node.js. And the dash P switch is to pass a couple of parameters. One is for which server to use, and one is for which security creds to use when connecting. So I've got that in my copy paste buffer. Generating the code turns out just as easy as generating the docs, which I secretly love. Um, and in the generated Node.js folder, so I've got some Node.js. I'm going to need to run, when it generates, it generates like you, you a whole readme with a load of instructions. You need to run npm install and then npm start, OK? Those are the instructions. I'm going to, because I'm configuring to connect to a cloud-hosted instance of Apache Kafka, I need to give it the credentials that it needs to connect. So I'm going to download from the web interface. And there's a CLI tool for this, but um, let's do it this way so you can more clearly see what's happening. I'm going to download the uh, access key and the certificate that I need to connect. You need the CA cert as well, but I already have that. Now I'm going to move those files. Top tip, if you download same named files all the time, always move them out the downloads folder rather than copying them. Um, and then you won't have to remember if it's service key six or service key five uh, when you want to move them. Because I can't type and talk at the same time. Sorry about that. And I need the certificate as well as the key. Yes, put that here. Yes, whatever was here, never mind. All right. What else do we need to do? I've run npm install. I've shown you carapace is enabled. I've downloaded the security threads. Oh, we need to create a topic. Let's go here. Oh, I have the door sensor topic. Oh, it's probably got data in it. Oh, well, let's take a risk, see what happens. Um, I think we're ready to go. So I'm going to run this code now. It's going to be in production, so I need to let Node know that's what it should do. Uh, npm start. There we go. So we took an API, async API description um, of a system that would subscribe to listen to door sensor data. We generated some code from that data. We set it up to connect to an existing Kafka service running in the cloud. Um, and our code is able to run successfully. I hope you're all very impressed with this demo. Oh, you wanted to see some data flowing as well. <laughs> all right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I'm just going to steal the uh, sample data out of the documentation. Yet another benefit of having great docs. Um, and we can just use this web interface to quickly produce a message. So I can produce this message. And we can check that it's there and everything looks OK. Quite like this little web interface for small things. Indeed, I had already sent some data. This is what I've just sent. And if we go back to our running script, it's got it. All the generated code does is echo that it received the data. But if you send the wrong payload or something else that's not expected, then you'll see errors here. So this is already set up to ingest that data. And again, all I've done is feed it the async API specification with the, with the, with the server details, make sure the files that it needs to correct are there, um, and connect them. Oh, Javier says he's impressed. OK, fantastic. Well, I have one more trick up my sleeve and a little bit of time. So I'm going to try and run this one super quickly. Um, for this, I want to show you a tool called Microx, which is for generating test data. The UI is probably logged out. No, it hasn't. Here we go. So if you're doing API testing or mocking, then Microx is one example of a tool that you might use. It understands async API specifications. How handy. I can just 
import or rather upload my subscribe spec da, da, da. and like this it says it got it so that's a good start and now in list of apis here it is there are a couple of things i want you to to notice here um, and that is here's our sample data right at the bottom of the screen it's um there's both of the examples are here. So Microx has picked up the examples from our async API description, and it's going to use that as sample data, which is a really great place to start. It does use a special topic. So I'm going to copy this to my clipboard <laughs> because we're going to need that data in a minute. The other thing we need to do is we need to regenerate the code so that it's using the development server details. Those people paying very close attention noticed that there was another command. And this one just sets the server to be development and doesn't use the security um, creds that we were using before. And I've overwritten the existing file, the existing uh, directory of code. It's pretty similar, right? There's just some different config. Because of Microx using its own idea of what the topic should be, I also need to sneakily hop in here and change this setting. Um, and that's good, I think, to keep your testing in like a separate space. So the good news is when I did this and created this API, Microx, which I'm running in a local Docker Compose setup, um, and I can share that with you if you're interested, they wrote a great tutorial about it, is already sending data. So when I do uh, npm start, with a bit of luck, we'll see, there we go, that the data's already coming through <clears throat> and it's actually still streaming. So it just streams a couple of packets every few seconds. This is an ideal thing to to, to develop against. Um, it looks a bit like real data. I can add lots of examples to test some different edge cases and be sure that I'm seeing those cases and that as I work on things, they look as they should. So. Um, just, I just love this. Every time I give this talk, there's another tool that is ready to accept async API and work out the box. So could not resist including that for you today. Um, that's pretty much what I want to show you about the landscape of the tools. I mentioned the playground there, um, the generator that I use for the docs and for the code. There's Microx, which is sending that test data that you've seen already. I want to give a mention to Spectral. Now, that's an open source tool, also Node.js. I don't know why. Um, from uh, Stoplight, they are open API specialists. Spectral is their linting tool. It's very opinionated, <laughs> but also really configurable. And it can validate your async API descriptions as well. That's well worth a look. And I mentioned the VS Code um, plugin extension probably for VS Code extension, um, and that is there as well. Async API is bringing formality and repeatability to the way that we interact with these systems. It's helping machines, it's helping humans, it's helping collaboration. I love that it's an open standard. Um, I think that's incredibly important that we can all have input into the process you can go to the meetings, you can see the public roadmap, you can see the commits coming in for all the tools and the very long running conversation that's going on right now about publish and subscribe being confusing. That is all out there. They're a welcoming community. Um, and I think they're going to enable some really large scale open source integrations in the future. I'm very excited about it. And I hope that this was interesting to you. I'm going to leave this resources list up while I answer your questions. If you have questions, you should type them now. OK, link to the Apache Kafka project. Shout out to Apache Kafka for the 3.0 release that went out today. I am so excited. That is awesome news. Um, Async API, great community. I've said my piece. Um, I'm contractually obliged to mention Ivan. You might also be interested. We have a no credit card free trial for 30 days. So if you don't have Kafka handy or you want to give it a try, great place to try it. I do developer relations there, so you can complain to me about stuff or let me know if you have questions. The example specifications that I mentioned are here. 
um, on GitHub, in the Thingam Industries repo, in the Ivan org. Please help yourself. And again, you can throw your questions in there if you have them. You saw Microx in action, so there's the link to that. Um, the API specifications conference is next week. So there's a bunch more async API content, open API content, other API specifications are available. Um, so you might be interested in that. And I will also shout out to a bunch of async API community events that are coming up um, because I think I might be their unofficial advocate at this point. Um, they're running a hackathon all the way through October. So that's an amazing way to get hands on um, and involved in the community. There's also a conference running in November and the call for papers there is already open. So for more information about that, you can go to conference.asyncapi.com. I have five minutes left. That was, a, that, was a, that was a fun tour of tasks. If you have questions or comments, um, you know, please go ahead and type them into the chat. I am here, I am happy to talk. Um, and yeah, I hope this was interesting. I'm a huge fan of both Kafka and um, Async API. So it was a real pleasure to be at such a cool event and uh, sharing them both with you. Um, I see Zayodin, I'm probably mangling that, I'm sorry, asking, can we use async APIs to put di data, put direct data to Kafka? The data needs to come from somewhere to Kafka, but async API is a great way of describing that integration. So you can generate some code that would know how to correctly transform a, a data array to, to be in the right format for the payload that Kafka is expecting. So it's it's a thing that is a description format, and then the generated tools that you've just seen can help you. And then you probably just write a little bit of code to take the data from wherever you have it and get it into Kafka. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, Javier says that they have no questions, that, although then I must have covered every possible angle. Uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. Um, <laughs> I will be sharing my slides and tweeting them. I think my, yeah, my at Lorna Jane Twitter handle is on the slide. So um, I'm going to upload and, and share these right after I fix the spelling mistake on this slide. And if you can't see it, I'm not pointing it out, but I can't unsee it now. So sorry about that. OK, well, if you think of anything else, feel free to ping me on Twitter, ping me on the platform. If you try this out in the future, I would still love to know how you get on with it, um, what questions you have. And like I say, I think both the, uh, the Kafka community and the Async API community would be super happy to hear from you. They're both great places to hang out. Um, oh, thanks for the kind words, Adam. That's really cool. Thank you for coming. And I will, yeah, see you on the internet.